Hello, this is Eric Strong, and this is the 19th and next to last lecture in this course on understanding ABGs. The topic is dyshemoglobinemia, specifically focusing on methemoglobin and carbon monoxide poisoning. The learning objectives are to be familiar with the structure and function of hemoglobin, including the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, to be familiar with the basic principles and limitations of pulse oximetry, to know the physiologic actions of methemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin, and finally, to be able to identify methemoglobinemia and carbon monoxide poisoning at the bedside. Although I've tried to keep these lectures clinically focused, I'm going to start this particular lecture with some review of basic science because it is necessary to understand the basics of oxygen transport in order to diagnose the presence of dysfunctional hemoglobin. As I reviewed in lecture 16, there are two mechanisms by which oxygen is transported in arterial blood. A tiny fraction is directly dissolved in blood, which we can assess by measuring the partial pressure of oxygen with an ABG. The overwhelming majority of oxygen is transported bound to hemoglobin. This oxygen can be assessed by SpO2, which is measured from a pulse oximeter, or from SaO2, which is usually calculated from an ABG. Both SpO2 and SaO2 are colloquially referred to as the O2 sat, although neither is accurate in all situations. Actually, it is this inaccuracy of SpO2 and SaO2 on which we will rely to suggest the presence of abnormal forms of hemoglobin, and which I will discuss later. Here's the equation commonly used to calculate oxygen saturation. It is the concentration of oxyhemoglobin divided by the total concentration of all hemoglobin, expressed as a percentage. Unfortunately, that denominator is often estimated as the sum of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. Although this initially seems to be a logical substitution, it is based on the false assumption that oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin are the only significant forms of hemoglobin. Let's revisit ways to measure O2 sat. Here's a picture of a typical pulse oximeter probe, which provides a real-time measurement of O2 sat. It's usually a small hinged device that loosely clamps around a fingertip. There are also probes that are much thinner and actually taped directly to the patient's skin, which result in less movement artifact and with less chance of being dislodged. How does this device work? To understand that, we need to look at a graph relating the relative degree of light absorption of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin over a range of wavelengths. Here's the absorption curve for oxygenated hemoglobin. There's a nadir of absorption around 660 nanometers, which falls into the red zone in the visible light spectrum. Thus, this is why oxygenated hemoglobin appears red, because it preferentially reflects and transmits that range of light wavelengths. Here's the absorption curve for deoxygenated hemoglobin. It has lower absorption in the infrared range above 800 nanometers. To determine the relative concentrations of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin, pulse oximeters emit light specifically at 660 nanometers and 940 nanometers, and then look at the relative amount of light at those wavelengths which is transmitted through the tissue. The degree of light transmission at 660 nanometers is mostly a function of the concentration of oxygenated hemoglobin, while the degree of light transmission at 940 nanometers is mostly a function of the concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin. This is a very simple schematic of how this looks in the actual pulse ox probe. A light emitter on one side with a photo detector on the other. The two wavelengths of light are then shown through the tissue and detected on the other side. The photo detectors only register transmitted light of alternating intensity. Otherwise, the pulse oximeter would erroneously report values based on light transmission through veins and extravascular tissue. Now that I've discussed how SpO2 is determined, I'm going to talk a little more about SaO2. The first important point is that the definition of SaO2 is not universal. There is SaO2 as calculated via traditional ABG analyzer, and there is SaO2 as measured via a device known as a co-oximeter.
When the term SiO2 is used in lectures and on wards, it almost always refers to the O2 sat that is automatically calculated by a bedside ABG analyzer. This empirically derived calculation uses the PaO2, pH, bicarb, and occasionally temperature. In case anyone is tempted to actually attempt this calculation themselves, it's a bit of a doozy. Here is the specific calculation used by the popular iStat models of handheld ABG analyzers. In contrast to this, when the term SaO2 is used in literature, it usually refers to the O2 saturation measured by cooximetry, which is the gold standard for the determination of oxyhemoglobin concentration. This, of course, raises the question of how does a cooximeter work? It's actually the same principle as pulse oximetry, but instead of using just two wavelengths of light to probe blood absorption patterns, it uses many different wavelengths, typically around eight, depending on the specific manufacturer of the device. Although real-time non-invasive pulse cooximeters have recently been developed, these are not available at most institutions, which still rely on the testing of arterial blood samples on a relatively large cooximetry machine in a central lab. As mentioned before, O2SAT via cooximetry is usually referred to as SAO2 in the literature. However, I personally think it makes much more sense to refer to it as percentage O2 hemoglobin, which is the term used by most cooximetry machines themselves when they display or print out results. This hasn't become standard practice to use this term yet, but I hope someday it will. I'll now talk about the structure and function of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is an iron-containing oxygen transport protein. It is classified as a globular protein, which means it's, it is roughly spherical or shaped like a globe. Hemoglobin is composed of four protein subunits, which in people over the age of one year uh, are two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. Each subunit contains one heterocyclic ring bound to a single iron ion, represented here by its chemical symbol Fe. This is known as heme, and is represented by green in the hemoglobin schematic on the right. Hence the word hemoglobin, which is a fusion of heme and globular protein. Within hemoglobin, it is the iron ion to which oxygen binds. As each hemoglobin molecule contains four heme groups, there are four iron ions, and therefore each can carry four molecules of oxygen. You probably hadn't noticed but adjacent to the iron ion in the diagram is a very small Roman numeral 2 in superscript. What does this mean? It means that the iron ion is currently in a plus 2 oxidation state. This is commonly referred to as ferrous iron. The oxidation state of this ion is critical because oxygen can only bind to ferrous iron. If something converts this iron from a plus 2 state to a plus 3 state, known as ferric iron, oxygen can no longer bind. Hemoglobin in which the iron of heme has been oxidized into ferric iron is what is known as met hemoglobin. The four subunits of hemoglobin exhibit something known as positive cooperation in which a ligand's binding to one of multiple binding sites increases the affinity of the other sites to that ligand. This will be clear with a short animation. So here we have our four hemoglobin subunits 2 alpha and 2 beta, and we'll give each a heme functional unit with the little green sphere representing the iron to which oxygen will eventually bind. We'll then put the four subunits together into a complete hemoglobin protein. You can tell it's fully deoxygenated by its bluish hue. As this hemoglobin floats around in the cytoplasm of a red blood cell, there's oxygen sort of floating around dissolved in the solution. And there are other hemoglobin proteins, many of which may be oxygenated as these are, with oxygen bound to their heme groups. And the oxygen molecules in the other hemoglobin proteins are just floating around, relatively ignoring the fully deoxygenated or desaturated hemoglobin in the middle. And then suddenly, one particular oxygen molecule feels just enough attraction to a free heme group that it binds. Once it does so, the affinity of the other heme groups in this particular molecule of hemoglobin is increased and oxygen is attracted much more readily 
until quite quickly the hemoglobin is fully saturated with its four oxygen molecules. The consequence of this positive cooperation is seen in the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, which shows the nonlinear relationship between the partial pressure of oxygen and the percentage of hemoglobin bound to oxygen. Here is where arterial blood typically sits with a PO2 between 80 and 100 millimeters of mercury and the resulting O2 saturation of 98 to 99%. And here is mixed venous blood with a typical PVO2 of around 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury and a corresponding O2 sat in the high 60s. As blood with near complete saturation moves from the arteries into the capillaries, it encounters a lower oxygen tension as oxygen is taken up by the peripheral tissues in the process of cellular respiration, specifically oxidative phosphorylation. As oxygen tension drops below a critical value of around 45 to 50, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen dramatically drops, allowing oxygen to be offloaded, so to speak, where it is required. The nonlinear nature of the curve also helps to explain why modest and even moderate amounts of hypoxemia can have minimal impact on the body's short-term well-being. Since most oxygen in the blood is transported by hemoglobin and not by oxygen being dissolved in blood itself, overall transport of oxygen is not significantly altered over a wide range of oxygen tensions. In other words, PaO2 in the 60s and 70s may not be normal and should be investigated, but they are unlikely to be acutely dangerous. The oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve is not static, but can be altered by a number of physiologic changes in blood. For example, the curve can be shifted to the right in which hemoglobin saturations will be lower at the same PO2. This actually facilitates easier unloading of oxygen in the peripheral tissues. The four major causes of a rightward shift are increased PCO2, decreased pH, increased temperature, and increased concentration of a compound called 2,3-DPG. The first three are nonspecific markers of increased metabolic activity, and 2,3-DPG is produced by red blood cells in response to hypoxemia. In other words, these effects are quite advantageous. Although it is only trivia, unless you're studying to be a biochemist, uh, the tightly linked effects of PCO2 and pH are sometimes referred to as the Bohr effect, named after the Danish physiologist Christian Bohr, himself father to the famous physicist Niels Bohr. And the curve can also be leftward shifted, essentially by the opposite of things which cause a rightward shift. So now that we have reviewed the necessary basic science background, let's take a look at some abnormal hemoglobins. As I mentioned before, normal hemoglobin, whether oxygenated or deoxygenated, contains iron in the positive two oxidation state, whereas met hemoglobin contains iron in the positive three oxidation state. What is sometimes unappreciated is that some normal level of met hemoglobinemia exists in all people. It is a consequence of the oxidizing power of oxygen. Usually, when oxygen is released by hemoglobin, it is released in the same state as it initially bound to it. However, sometimes the molecule of oxygen grabs an extra electron as it is released, forming a superoxide radical and leaving behind oxidized hemoglobin or met hemoglobin. So why exactly is met hemoglobinemia bad? Because it does two things. First, it shifts the oxygen hemoglobin dis dissociation curve to the left. Second, it causes a decrease in maximum hemoglobin saturation because hemoglobin subunits containing heme groups with a plus three iron cannot bind uh, to oxygen. So in the presence of met hemoglobinemia, blood can carry less oxygen and is less able to release it in peripheral tissues. Luckily, the human body has means to reduce the normally formed met hemoglobin back into normal hemoglobin and does so using an important enzyme called cytochrome B5 reductase. This helps to keep the normal met hemoglobin fraction at under 1%. A rare genetic deficiency of cytochrome B5 reductase exists, which can lead to a hereditary form of met hemoglobinemia. The majority of homozygotes for this recessive trait are cyanotic, but amazingly often otherwise asymptomatic 
with normal life expectancy. Another form of hereditary hemoglobinemia is known as hemoglobin M disease, where a mutation in one of the subunits of hemoglobin leads to its resistance in being reduced from the plus 3 ferric state back to the plus 2 ferrous state. Methemoglobin formation isn't always normal, however. There are also various drugs and toxins that can make this process occur at a much faster rate than normal, overwhelming the reducing capacity of cytochrome B5 reductase. This is when clinically relevant methemoglobinemia can develop. In this situation, another path to methemoglobin reduction becomes relevant, an enzyme called NADPH methemoglobin reductase. This enzyme has minimal activity in the absence of an electron carrier present in RBCs that can interact with NADPH. However, exogenous methylene blue can serve this purpose, activating this pathway and substantially increasing the rate of methemoglobin clearance. Methylene blue should be used cautiously as it can trigger serotonin syndrome and in G6PD deficient individuals due to the theoretical risk of inducing hemolysis. While I mentioned the existence of hereditary methemoglobinemia, most cases are acquired through drug or toxin exposure, though some of these patients may be predisposed due to an otherwise subclinical partial deficiency of cytochrome B5 reductase. Here is an incomplete list of the most commonly cited causes of acquired methemoglobinemia. It may seem unexpected to see methylene blue on the list, since this is the primary treatment for methemoglobinemia. This doesn't make sense until you realize that methylene blue does not reduce methemoglobin back to hemoglobin directly, but rather helps to oxidize NADPH back to NADP+, which is necessary for the action of NADPH methemoglobin reductase to reduce methemoglobin. In other words, methylene blue is actually an oxidizing agent, which is why it is potentially harmful in G6PD deficiency. It generally takes very high levels of methylene blue to induce methemoglobinemia, however. While this list may be too long and obscure to bother memorizing, you should remember that the majority of cases of acquired methemoglobinemia, at least in the United States, are due to either dapsone or benzocaine, the latter usually in the setting of bronchoscopy or a transesophageal echocardiogram. If you're really wanting to remember the whole list, however, there is a convenient mnemonic, dapsone. D is obvious, A is for anesthetics, P is for primakine, S is for sulfamethoxazole, O is for uh, others such as herbicides and pesticides, N is for nitroglycerin and nitroprusside, and E for environmental such as nitrates in well water. The presentation of methemoglobinemia can start within minutes of exposure to an offending agent. Symptoms are largely dependent upon methemoglobin concentration. Once methemoglobin levels are above 15%, the patient will begin to appear cyanotic, irrespective of the actual levels of oxyhemoglobin or deoxyhemoglobin. At 20%, the patient will develop headache, anxiety, and dizziness. At 30%, dyspnea, fatigue, and confusion. And finally, once above 50%, seizures, acidosis, arrhythmias, and if not rapidly corrected, death. The cyanosis of methemoglobinemia can be explained by looking at its absorption pattern. Here is the pattern for oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. And here is methemoglobin. You can see that it has a relatively high amount of absorption occurring at red wavelengths, which is why these patients appear to be blue. Interestingly, the actual blood of these patients with severe methemoglobinemia is often described as brown in color, which when observed strongly suggests the diagnosis as nothing else to my knowledge causes brown blood. Since conventional pulse oximetry uses only two wavelengths of light, it is not accurate in the presence of significant levels of methemoglobin. Increasing methemoglobin levels will lead to lower O2 sats on pulse ox until it asymptotically approaches 85% once methemoglobin reaches the mid-20s. Here's a summary of the clues to the presence of methemoglobinemia. First, cyanosis despite normal SaO2 and or a relatively high SpO2. In other words, unless a patient has severe polycythemia, cyanosis requires an O2 sat in the 70s or lower.
seeing a cyanotic patient with an O2 sat in the mid to high 80s should immediately suggest methemoglobinemia. Also, cyanosis that develops during bronchoscopy or endoscopy, an unusual color of blood, as mentioned before, and finally, a significant difference between the SAO2 calculated by ABG analyzer and the SPO2 as measured by pulse oximetry. I'm going to now move on to carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide has a variety of detrimental actions in the body, all of which act synergistically to impair aerobic metabolism. Some of the actions directly involve hemoglobin. Carbon monoxide binds to the same heme moiety that oxygen usually does. As carbon monoxide diffuses across the alveolar capillary membrane extremely well, and as hemoglobin's affinity for carbon monoxide is 240 times that for oxygen, relatively modest sounding concentrations of carbon monoxide can lead to clinically significant concentrations of carbon monoxide bound hemoglobin, more commonly known as carboxyhemoglobin. The binding of carbon monoxide to one of the hemoglobin subunits causes an allosteric change such that the affinity of the remaining subunits for oxygen is increased. This results in a leftward shift in the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, and thus oxygen can't be unloaded as effectively in the peripheral tissues. Also, just as with met hemoglobinemia, there is a decrease in the maximum hemoglobin concentration since hemoglobin subunits balance of carbon monoxide can obviously not bind to oxygen as well. In this particular example, this curve would correspond to a patient with a potentially fatal carboxyhemoglobin level of about 40%. In addition to its direct effects on hemoglobin, carbon monoxide also affects mitochondria. Specifically, it binds to and inactivates cytochrome C oxidase, a critical member of the electron transport chain. Thus, it interferes with oxidative phosphorylation in ATP generation. It's the same mechanism resulting from cyanide poisoning. Most clinically significant carbon monoxide poisonings are suicide attempts. Among those that are accidental, they can be the consequence of fire-related smoke inhalation, which often coexists with cyanide poisoning, poorly functioning heating systems, improperly vented stoves, and motor vehicles operating indoors. The clinical presentation of acute carbon monoxide poisoning can be nonspecific and variable. However, the severity of symptoms and rapidity of onset is directly related to ambient concentration. At 35 parts per million, generally resulting in a carboxyhemoglobin blood level of under 10%, symptoms commonly include headache and dizziness with an onset after 6 to 8 hours of constant exposure. At 200 parts per million, blood level is typically closer to 20% with headache, dizziness, and mild confusion setting in within two to three hours. 800 parts per million results in a 30% blood level and severe confusion with onset within 45 minutes. With 3,200 parts per million, carbon monoxide levels are at 50% with symptom onset within five to 10 minutes and death within 30. Finally, at 12,800, CO levels of 70% can result in death within 3 minutes, and incapacitation is as short as 2-3 to three breaths. Interestingly, while normal carboxyhemoglobin levels are under 3%, active smokers can have levels as high as 15%. The fact that they do not generally become symptomatic from their recreational smoke inhalation is a consequence of the development of compensatory mechanisms, including production of 2,3-DPG, and an increase in their hemoglobin production. This chart is probably starting to look awfully familiar. Here is the absorption pattern for carboxyhemoglobin. You can see that its relatively poor absorption in the red is about equal to that of oxyhemoglobin, which results in two interesting phenomenon. First, there is a rare but often mentioned physical finding of a cherry red complexion in patients with carbon monoxide poisoning, since both arterial and venous blood have high concentrations of red reflecting carboxyhemoglobin. Second, the pulse oximeter essentially reads carboxyhemoglobin as oxyhemoglobin. The specific empirically derived equation relating SpO2 to oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin is here. As a consequence, patients can have completely normal looking O2 sats via pulse oximetry 
but still have extremely low oxygen content in the blood. There is no specific antidote for carbon monoxide, and poisoning victims are typically managed with high flow supplemental oxygen at as high an FiO2 as can be provided. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, in which patients are exposed to 100% oxygen at pressures of two to three times normal atmospheric pressure, is recommended in cases of severe poisoning, but is only available in a limited number of locations around the world. Now, this particular one is randomly in Saskatchewan, Canada, um, and in fairness to the patient, I'll point out that I have absolutely no idea what her indication was for hyperbaric therapy. The common observation of paradoxical pulse oximeter readings in the presence of a dyshemoglobinemia has resulted in occasional use of something called the saturation gap. Unlike other gaps, like the anion gap for example, the saturation gap is not frequently used in practice as its sensitivity and specificity is poorly studied and as dyshemoglobinemias are relatively rare. However, I still think it's important for healthcare providers to be aware of it, particularly those who work in emergency medicine where most dyshemoglobinemias are diagnosed. Adding to the uncertainty of utility of the saturation gap, it is variably defined in the literature. However, in the absence of routine cooximetry, the most practical definition of an oxygen saturation gap is the absolute value of the O2sat measured via pulse oximetry and O2sat calculated from a standard bedside ABG analyzer. A gap greater than 5% suggests the presence of either methemoglobin or carboxyhemoglobin. At one final time, here is our absorption patterns for the four major variants of hemoglobin. So here is a summary slide comparing methemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. Both cause a leftward shift of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and a decrease in the maximal oxygen carrying capacity of blood, while carbon monoxide also disrupts the electron transport chain in oxidative phosphorylation. Met hemoglobinemia can rarely be inherited, but is more commonly caused by exposure to oxidizing drugs or a variety of toxins. Carbon monoxide poisonings are usually caused by exposure to carbon monoxide most cases of which are intentional. Methemoglobinemia is commonly associated with cyanosis, while carbon monoxide poisoning is rarely associated with a cherry red complexion. Finally, in methemoglobinemia, O2sat via pulse ox is usually lower than the calculated O2sat by the ABG, but never drops below about 85%. While in carbon monoxide poisoning, SpO2 sat is always equal to or greater than SaO2. I'm going to end by briefly going through two examples of how to diagnose these conditions at the bedside. Example 1. A code blue is called after a 68-year-old woman undergoing transesophageal echocardiogram prior to elective cardioversion for AFib developed dyspnea and confusion. She had been fine immediately prior to the procedure. On exam, she is in respiratory distress and is cyanotic. Vitals are as follows. Temperature 99.2, heart rate 110, blood pressure 125 over 76, respiratory rate 26, and O2 sat 85% via pulse ox while she is on 10 liters of supp supplemental oxygen via simple face mask. And here is her ABG on the 10 liters of oxygen. If we went through the same type of oxygenation analysis introduced in lectures 16 and 17, our first step here would be to check the AA gradient. Here is the alveolar gas equation to calculate the alveolar oxygen tension. Plug in our numbers using an estimated 60% FiO2 for the 10 liters via face mask, and we get an approximate P big A O2 of 383 millimeters of mercury. The AA gradient is thus 383 minus 340, or 43. For step two, the expected AA gradient can be calculated from this equation. We plug in the numbers and find it to be 41 millimeters of mercury. Thus, she has a normal AA gradient hypoxemia. Finally, I will now introduce a step three, check the saturation gap. Remember, this is the absolute values of SpO2 minus SaO2, which in this case is 15%. The presence of a saturation gap suggests either methemoglobinemia or carbon monoxide poisoning, and obviously given the clinical scenario, the former is the diagnosis.
looking back, one could probably make a reasonable and appropriate hypothesis based solely on the vignette alone by observing that the patient was cyanotic at an O2 sat that should not be low enough to result in cyanosis. Example 2. A 52-year-old man was brought to the ER after his wife returned home to find him on the floor unresponsive. He had called her earlier to report feeling unwell with a headache and nausea. He has no significant past medical history and is on no meds. His vitals are temperature 98.6, heart rate 95, blood pressure 118 over 68, respiratory rate 6, and O2 sat of 96% on room air. He is minimally responsive, but his exam is otherwise unremarkable. Here is the ABG. Let's ignore the life-threatening acid-base disturbance and focus just on his oxygenation. If we go through the same process as before, step one, check the AA gradient. Plugging in our numbers, we get a P big A O2 of 69, thus his gradient is 19. Step two, estimate the normal or expected AA gradient. A normal AA gradient for his age and while breathing room air is 17. So this patient has a normal AA gradient hypoxemia. Step three, check the saturation gap which in this case we calculate to be 21%. Obviously, the context of this lecture strongly suggests the saturation gap to be the consequence of carbon monoxide poisoning, which in this particular case seems accidental. You'll notice that the SpO2 was falsely normal at 96, despite a remarkably low PO2 and SaO2. The only condition that causes this is carbon monoxide poisoning. However, there is a significant catch to relying on the saturation gap in that a significant gap will only exist in the presence of a low P little a O2. For example, imagine if this patient's wife came home 10 minutes sooner after he was already suffering from severe poisoning, but before he had started to hypoventilate. Our ABG might look like this. The normal P a C O2, P little a O2 is also normal, and thus the O2 sat as calculated by the ABG analyzer will also be normal. Concisely stated, the presence of a saturation gap in carbon monoxide poisoning depends upon the presence of hypoxemia. That concludes this lecture on methemoglobinemia and carboxyhemoglobin. I hope you found it interesting and useful. Please feel free to post a comment if you have any questions. The next and final lecture in this course on understanding ABGs is entitled Bringing It All Together and will demonstrate how all of the separate systems of acid-base balance ventilation, oxygen diffusion, and oxygen transport all fit together into an amazing intertwined whole that results in physiologic homeostasis.